We're going to kick off this session with the head of the Center for Epidemic Interventions Research at the Norwegian Institute of Public Research, Professor Atle Fretheim. Welcome. Thank you very much. So, infection control in pandemics such as the COVID pandemic, what works? So we can start with uh, one example of one of the questions that we've been asking ourselves since day one uh, during the pandemic. Um, are they effective? Which one's more effective? Uh, been a lot of confusion. One way to document this confusion is, for example, to look at this map, which is from uh, August 2020, illustrating the policies around the use of face masks. So the green countries, they don't require any use of face masks. They might recommend them at that time. The red countries, there you are mandated to use face masks, much or all the time, basically, at least outside. And the brownish ones, there, there's a mix um, where they are, uh, face masks are required in certain spaces. So all over the place at that time. No tendency to a consensus, even if you look at Europe, maybe a consensus in Scandinavia, but apart from that, it's all over the place. People don't seem to agree about the usefulness of mandating the use of face masks. That's an uncontroversial statement, I think. One of the few uncontroversial statements you can make about face masks is that there is much confusion, has been. And even three years into the pandemic, it was interesting to note um, that until February this year, you needed to wear a face mask to take the train or the bus in Germany and Spain. While we, at that time, we had forgotten all about masks, right? We hadn't been using them for, for at least a year. So even three years, the point of that is, three years into the pandemic, there was still no sign of a consensus around the useful, or at least no clear sign of a consensus around the usefulness of mandating face masks. Another example of uh, similar confusion is school closure as a measure to, uh, to try to stop the spread of COVID, potentially other, other airborne infections as well. I'll use the map as a data source again, because it illustrates something that I find entertaining, but also illustrates the confusion. This is from March. This is from the day we closed our schools in Norway. We were very early. As you can see, the gray ones, there are a few countries, maybe, I don't know, 20. Uh, we can see that 36 countries had closed their um, schools, all schools at that stage, and Norway was early, uh, very early adopter. Uh, first in Europe, same day as Denmark, I believe. Um, and this is two months later, and that has not received as much attention, and I find it interesting. We were also extremely early in opening our schools again. So we were among the very first perhaps the first country that reopened the schools among the schools that had closed their schools, among the countries that had closed their schools. We were in a very peculiar company with Belarus, Turkmenistan, Papua New Guinea, and Papua New Guinea. <laughs> so it's a very interesting group of countries. And, and why that happened? Well, it's... There are country-specific issues, like in Norway, uh, education and the right of children to go to school is a very strong value. That's at least my speculation, uh, being part of the, or ob observing uh, close at hand the discussions. So, there has been a huge variation in COVID-19 strategies, not only for face masks and school closures, but all across the board, uh, from country to country. Uh, and. I think it's fair to assume or to claim that a major reason for this huge variation and confusion is that we don't really know what works. Uh, a lot of people know what works, but they seem to disagree what works. That's part of the, part of the problem. Um, it is also a sort of sad paradox is that we seem to acknowledge that we are not sure what is the best strategy and what we should do or should have done when the pandemic struck. Uh, but even so, we were not able as a collective globally to conduct many uh, studies to assess the effectiveness of various interventions. And that to me is a paradox because we all agreed that we needed better knowledge, more evidence, but we were not able to produce that in the years that uh, have passed since uh, early 2020. So if you look, for example, at the number of 
randomized trials that we heard about earlier today that have been conducted in the field of infection control. There are, you can count them on a couple of hands or a couple of person's hands. Very, very few randomized trials. If you look at randomized trials related to COVID and medication and vaccines, we're talking one or two thousand. So it's a huge discrepancy. Some good, some bad reasons, some understandable reasons for that, but it is still um, a paradox. And this, uh, my claim, begs the question, why? Why are we seeing so few randomized trials of infection control measures? Because um, uh, that's, that's a question we need to ask to, to do better next time. And uh, that's, it's very difficult to scientifically document why something is not happening. Uh, but these are um, my speculations based on personal experience and um, armchair thinking. So uh, I believe, and that's maybe the most controversial claim, that there has been a lack of tradition in the public health field and uh, also in the infection control field for conducting randomized trials. With the very notable exception of vaccines, where there has been a very strong tradition for conducting randomized trials, which in my mind is weird. Not that, that randomized trials are done, that's great, but that the idea, the need for randomized trials in vaccine research is uncontroversial, while for other public health measures, it doesn't seem to be emphasized as much. And we're talking about sort of the same people, the public health practitioners field. Of course, there is always some financial barriers. If you need research to do something, they always, we always say that we need funding. But we don't always need a lot of funding. Many of the infection control measures were implemented anyway, so we didn't, wouldn't necessarily have to cost a lot of money. But yes, money is needed to, to get things done. I think the third is perhaps, perhaps the most important barrier, if you can rate them. I'm not sure if you can. But there are a lot of legal, ethical, practical and political barriers to randomizing groups of the population. So if you want to conduct a randomized trial of an infection control measure that, is, um, that, that um, affects the society, like, like closing schools, uh, that has a huge, um, that interrupts a lot of things uh, and you need political support, there are a lot of legal barriers that will pop up um, and uh, you cannot necessarily expect that the population will applaud such, such an idea. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a challenge. And then there are also scientific, traditional, methodological challenges. For instance, that you very often need large sample sizes because although these interventions are potentially very important, they don't usually, in the bigger picture, have a huge effect that is easy to measure. And then you will often need a, a very, very large sample size. Not always, but uh, that, that can be an, be an issue. I know that can be an issue. Here is uh, an example of our, some of our failures, because uh, we've been trying to do this during the, um, the epidemic at the center where I work and my colleagues. We've tried to run randomized trials of a host of public health infection control measures, uh, and we've largely failed, uh, for mostly due to the reasons that I just mentioned. So this is just to show to you that we have tried but uh, we failed and we're pointing our finger to others to explain why we weren't <laughs> succeeding. Um, but these are, these are real barriers and these are real studies that came to the point, many, many maybe most of them came to the point of um, ethical clearance uh, to that stage. So these are not just loose ideas or um, uh, protocol stage together with collaborators, but were stopped for various reasons. So, is it too difficult then to carry out infection control trials of these types of interventions? Um, yes and no would be uh, my, my answer. Uh, as in all policy and public health uh, debates over the um, ability to carry out effectiveness studies, there are clearly some interventions that are impossible to, for example, randomize, like uh, border control, right? We, very hard to imagine randomizing border control to limit spread. I mean, how, do you, how would you even think about doing that? And just imagine the politics. It's completely, completely impossible. So we can't do that. But there are things we can do, and that have been done. Uh, very simple things like a question early on in the, in the pandemic was whether protecting the eyes could have an impact. That never received a lot of attention, but in the first, first 
reviews that came out. There was a very influential review in The Lancet very early on by a big group uh, on what are the potential interventions. And protect, eye protection was one of the, on their top of the list. And based on the observational data they had, it seemed to be nearly as effective as face masks, or based on their data, even more. But nobody believed that, neither did I. But anyway, it was potentially potentially something to be worth uh, checking out. Anyway, we did that, and that was not so difficult. Um, the main barrier we met in trying to recruit people to be randomized to wearing glasses or not when they were outside for a couple of weeks uh, was that we were not able to recruit the number of people that we thought we needed. Uh, and that proved also to be the case. We would have needed more than the 4,000 we got to measure what we had set out to measure, which was um, using positive test results from national reg registries. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the results. It's not very interesting anyway. And also, that's not the point. Uh, but I will show you that, yes, we did publish. So it is true. Um, we've also uh, repeated the same again as an example of it is possible. There have been two or three with ours, maybe four or five face mask trials during the pandemic, which in my mind, and that's probably the specific intervention that has been uh, evaluated the most during the pandemic in randomized trials, but four or five randomized trials of such a controversial um, intervention to me is very, very little. Um, but anyway, we have also recently conducted this, uh, similar as we did with the glasses, we asked people to, to take part, be randomized to wear a face mask or not when they were outside for a couple of weeks. Um, and um, I don't have the results here, but they're, they're a little bit exciting. Um, then the question is, okay, we failed, uh, largely failed. Uh, we as uh, researchers, as, as the larger public, in um, gaining new knowledge about the effects of these infection control measures. So we will be more or less probably back at square one next time round if we get another uh, pandemic in, in the coming years, which most people seem to, to expect. Um, so then the question is, what can we then do? to try to, to improve, to do better uh, next time. Um, and one thing we can do is to try to conduct trials during peacetime outside of pandemics. And a very, very um, logical thought is to utilize the annual influenza uh, pandemics. Remember, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, all the evidence or almost all the evidence that was pointed at and we based our recommendations on were from influenza trials. So we did believe, at least at that time, and we, I guess we still largely believe, that a lot of the things that work to pre prevent spread of influenza is likely to work for the spread of another similar sort of respiratory, I'm not sure what similar would mean, but anyway, something that seems to be spread in a similar way. Um, so if we could learn more about what prevents the spread of influenza, perhaps we could be better prepared for what, um, what, is, um, uh, what we can use the next time round. Or maybe we will have just as much COVID as influenza during the winter times in the coming years, so there'll be a mix, whatever. But what, it, what we have at hand to, you, to test in, um, interventions. That has been done. I mean, there have been randomized trials of, of infection control measures during influenza seasons, but there haven't been many. There have been a handful of those the last 15, 20 years. I think the big and challenging issue is what can we do to make it possible to carry out trials the next time around we get a pandemic? Will we be able to get going with, uh, with, uh, with trials from day one or day 31 or whatever? Uh, and there's a lot of work actually being done. There is, seems to be a, a global consensus that we need to do better and we need to, to lay the groundwork so that we are able to carry out these trials uh, when the situation arrives. And it'll be interesting to see how far we come over the next years because there's a lot of legislative work, ethics work, and of course, to gain the political support to, to be able to do this. Uh, finally, the, not really boasting, but I feel I should show that we have a center for this. So this is exactly what we're trying to do. Um, and we're eager to collaborate to get this field moving. Thank you. <laughs>